Hello, good morning, and welcome to Politics at Jack and Sam's Daily, the podcast that gives you pretty much everything you need to know about the day ahead in British politics in less than 20 minutes. Good morning. It's Wednesday, December the 4th. My name is Sam Coates of Sky News, and with me is Jack Blanchard of Politico. And after politicians of all stripes gathered in a Westminster hotel for the Spectator Parliamentarian of the Year to laugh with and at new editor Michael Gove, politics returns to its normal adversarial self today centred around Prime Minister's questions. Split screen, I suspect, with the complete political collapse in South Korea, with a coup that lasted marginally longer than this podcast, preventing the president (laughs) introducing martial law. I wonder if they had a timer. Uh, I can imagine the buzzer going off and him sort of giving up on the coup. Yeah, Um, yeah, it's it's a bitty day in Westminster daytime. As you say, PMQs will be the main thing. There's lots of other important but sort of unrelated stories around a big National Audit Office report uh, on prisons overcrowding, which we're to talk about. The government's got an announcement on nationalising the railways. There's rumours about them nationalising British steel as well. Uh, And there's a big summit going over in the uh, the EU that David Lammy is attending. Um, But why don't you tell us a little bit about last night, given you went to this big spectacle to award to do. Are you hung over this morning, Sam? Absolutely not. Never. That doesn't happen. Um, uh, <laughs> but I did think it was a, a completely fascinating moment in British politics. And and you mentioned all the little itty bitty things that are going on. Government basically let us letting us play today. Choose your own adventure as to what political story you end up you end up chasing today because none of them are, are particularly better. But I just. I sat there last night and wondered whether there isn't something slightly bigger staring us in the face. Uh, And that's the thing that I think is is worth dwelling on this morning and and actually where we should start. These awards, I've never been invited to these awards because I'm not a salubrian enough part of the the swamp. But Sam Coates, I imagine you've been going to the Spectators Parliamentarian of the Year Awards since they were invented in 1741 or something. What is it basically? It's like a big dinner. It's a big drinking session. All the great and the good in there. We've got the whole spotted list in in, in playbook, uh, our playbook email this morning. And and, and everyone seems to have been there except me. Um, (laughs) Just talk us through what actually happens, because I'm guessing most people listening to this podcast uh, haven't had the pleasure of of a big Westminster party like that I mean it's it's definitely a lot of fun and I'm sorry that you weren't there to enjoy it oh I'm, I'm not sorry but, but carry on. <laughs> I don't think the invitation will come next year in that case um and, and and that's part of it and and in many ways it's a sort of brilliant event there's a proper range of politicians from across the political spectrum uh, so all credit to Casey Balls and team for getting Angela Rayner Nigel Farage there in one room in Westminster uh in a in a hotel on Whitehall and um um, there was a superb all singing, all dancing MC act uh, by Michael Gove, uh, who handed out a series of awards. Uh, and the bell of the ball, undoubtedly, uh, was the uh, sort of not quite compare, but person who made the big keynote speech, which was Labour's health secretary, Wes Streeting. Uh, and how did Labour's health secretary do in the Tory lion's den, as the spectator <laughs> said? <laughs> I mean, one of the big takeaways from last night was Wes Streeting showed once again. Why he, I think he pretty much is the best front bench performer uh, in British politics at the moment. Um, sorry, Keir, sorry, Kemi. Um, he stood up in front of the spectator crowd and uh, just delivered a series of lines more than anything else aimed at his own side, which of course just went down brilliantly in the room. So he began by kind of summoning his best Tony Blair, declaring a new dawn has broken. And then to slight jeers, we are the masters now. Uh, And then said that how after years where people like Sajid Javid and George Osborne have done the kind of speech that he was doing at this event, uh, they finally invited a proper Tory to do the job (laughs) before hasty clarifying that that was a joke, although some of the Labour Party uh, might think that's a little bit close to the bone. Um, He sort of did get the room going um, and... Uh, he picked up his machine gun and uh, emptied it all over his own side and and, and the cabinet that he sits in uh, uh, and the front and his own front bench. So he said that Kemi Baden, the new Tory leader, was repeating the mistakes of the past, mistakes that Labour made in opposition. He said uh, the Tories were trashing their record in government, speaking to the membership, not the voters. And then added, if you carry on like this, you'll be energy secretary in 10 years. So Ooh. there's a dig at Ed Miliband. Ed Miliband. <laughs> Brutal. And the fact that Angela Rayner was sitting in the very front row didn't stop him throwing shade on her. Uh, he said to the whole room, I am delighted to welcome the Deputy Prime Minister to this event. Sitting over there, it's Pat McFadden. 
and Angela Rayner made a huge play of bursting out laughing and showing how completely relaxed she was uh, at this. Uh, I do slightly wonder uh, what she thought privately. Is there a serious point to all this, Sam? I mean, you know, these Westminster bashes that can be a great laugh, but tell us something that you really learned there that's going to that means something to people. I mean, look, I thought there was something bigger going on, though. You know, as we sort of sat there in the in a new location for this event, which is the super expensive ballroom of the new Raffles Hotel on Whitehall, uh, and um, uh, and I thought this particularly as I watched first time MP. Nigel Farage pick up his award of newcomer of the year. Um, and uh, let me just let me just sort of pan the camera out a bit uh, to explain. If you read the Times this morning, there's quite an important column by Danny Finkelstein about the role of money in politics. And, and this is off the back of the rumoured possible £100 million donation by Elon Musk uh, via one of his UK companies to Reform UK, which may or may not be coming down the track. Now, the point he's making is that in the past in Britain, we've always told ourselves that money plays a role, but, you know, quite a limited role in politics, partly largely because of the ban on political TV advertising and how we're not like America. But thanks to the Internet and social media and phones, that ban basically doesn't really matter anymore. So those with the deepest pockets can make the biggest inroads to the electorate in British politics. Now more than ever before, it's a trend that's been growing, but 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 really we've jumped the shark. And if you are looking at donations on the scale of 100 million quid, then those are game changers. And basically Finkelstein was making the case that money talks like never before. And, and that's kind of the link to last night, you know, and you could see it sort of looking around the room that there's a bit of a redrawing of the political map, much sort of money talking more than ever before. You had tycoon Paul Marshall sitting in the centre of the room. Why does he matter? Well, he is the new owner of The Spectator. He bought it a few, he took control of it a few months ago. Um, and arguably he's done more to sort of change the conversation around British politics than, than many people. He helped set up GB News. He's helped set up Unheard. He represents a slightly different type of conservatism that leans a little bit more into culture wars uh, than perhaps some traditional conservatives. And he was there at the middle uh, of the middle of this event, kind of as a, as a sort of symbol sitting next to Wes Streeting of money changing uh, politics. You had Nigel Farage, the o- he, he was the only leader, the only party leader to turn up to the event, because uh, all the rest were at a state banquet, promising to sort of turn the tide and take control. Uh, you, you've got a guy there who will use money, who hopes to be able to use money to change the political conversation and, 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 and a political revolution. Um, and uh, and you just got the sense that no- nothing can hold it back. Yesterday, the government said that they weren't going to cap donations as was rumored in the guardian um and uh you can see there is a danger that traditional ways of doing politics crumble as the internet allows money to play a much bigger role uh, and new figures come along and try and fund politics differently even youtube were sponsoring the event politics as a money maker for them as well as needing to keep politicians on their side i did i did think look around the room last night incredibly expensive ballroom it's possibly the most expensive sort of cross westminster event that there is and think, are we entering a new era of money being more important than it ever has been before? It's certainly true that, you know, people have laughed at Nigel Farage in this country for a very long time for various reasons. And he has been proven, uh, even if you don't agree with him on, on policy issues, he's been proven right in, in, in sort of testing the political, political weather time and time again. And he insists that reform is on the verge of doing something very big in this country. Um, of course, we don't know. But, you know, you look around the world at the trends and it, it, there's no reason to see why Britain should be insulated or different from that sort of thing. And you look at the sort of things people are concerned about in this country. It's clearly the pound in their pocket, as someone once said. It's 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 um, the, the scale of immigration and, and, and those trends in other countries have fueled people like Nigel Farage obviously to the very top of government. There doesn't seem to me to be any reason why that sort of thing can't happen here uh, over the next few years. The question is, um, are Labour as the incumbent power in any place to do anything about it? And you know they're thinking about this stuff very seriously now um, in Downing Street. Having rather taken reform for, I don't know if it's them for granted during the election, but sort of saw them as a helping hand during the election. You know, there were. I was speaking to um, to my Politico colleague Tim Ross this week, who sort of wrote the book on the 2024 election, and he was recounting um, to me how when Nigel Farage 
and made that announcement during the election campaign, Sam, where he said he was going to re-enter the political fray as, and, and come back as leader of reform. There was sort of cheering in Labour HQ, clenched fists and fist bumps. And, you know, this is the moment that's going to win us the election. And of course, it was in a way, you know, that the, the short term tactical gain for Labour was enormous. But you do wonder about the long term damage that could be inflicted upon Labour by Nigel Farage now that he's got a foothold in Parliament, if these sorts of trends continue over the next few years. And, and, and you do have to wonder whether a sort of populist TikTok driven um, uh, leader like Nigel Farage, whether Keir Starmer is the right sort of leader to be able to take that on in a world where personality really matters, where people are looking for someone who can defy incumbency and who can speak out against the man and the machine. Keir Starmer just looks very establishment. He always will look very establishment, whether you like him or not. He's not a massively inspiring figure in lots of ways. He doesn't look to me like the sort of politician that instinctively goes well against someone like Farage if if you believe these trends of populism and, 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 and so on will continue. And so I think there's a lot of thinking to be done in Labour HQ um, about how they combat that threat over the next few years, because it's not just the Tory vote that they're going to be eating into. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I watched last night, having uh, also watched that film that I referred everybody to yesterday, brilliant film by uh, Serena Barker Singh and Izzy uh, Lossov talking to young reform voters who are all energised by social media, young men who are who are going in a different political de- direction to what we've ever seen before. Uh, so if you haven't watched that, uh, do seek out uh, that film about uh, young men who back reform. But, but you just have to look at other bits of our politics crumbling. And uh, I do think in the context of Nigel Farage, what's, what happened yesterday in Wales is quite significant. The Conservative leader uh, won a vote of no confidence, but then decided to step down. This is Andrew R.T. Davis. Um, all sorts of cultural war if- issues have taken us to this point. I was quite struck by his quote on leaving. Uh, he told Matt Chorley uh, that mutinous colleagues had made his life very difficult Whilst I was offering a Welsh fry up with an extra black pudding on the side, a certain amount of my colleagues wanted muesli and croissants. I mean, that's a hell of a quote. I love it. But it strikes me that whether it's Tory or whether it's Labour, there are the, the sort of culture war aspect of politics has a possibility of tearing them apart. Whereas reform seems to know where it's coming from on these sorts of issues. And that's a danger that internal friction because of culture wars undermines established political parties. And that's exactly what reform wants and needs to see. And if it's backed by big money, uh, there is more of a chance of it getting there if old established parties start to crumble. And, And that's sort of what it feels like, like the Tories in Wales. And it was interesting to see Tim Montgomery, Sam, who the, the literal founder of Conservative Home website literally dreamed up the big grassroots site for the Tories that's been their main sort of chatterbox place for the last 10 or maybe longer years, joining reform yesterday and deciding he's had enough of the Conservatives. Um, the, the, the answer to all of this inside Labour HQ, or they think the answer to it, is is quite simply the rather boring delivery of government. Morgan McSweeney, the chief of staff in Downing Street's big idea has always been that you defeat um, the populist right um, by showing that normal government can actually improve people's lives. He had this theory about, you know, improving people's driveways and potholes and making people feel like they're their local area is 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 somewhere to be proud of and that, and that the local council or the the, the the national government can deliver that. And and the, and this is what Keir Starmer's big speech tomorrow Sam is all about. We're 24 hours away from Keir Starmer's big, definitely not a reset speech, but where he's going to set out clear targets, he says, for the for this parliament, the things that his government is going to measurably deliver so that people can see and feel like um, they got, that there was a reason for voting Labour and this government, this Labour government has achieved something by 2029 and we know we're going to see targets around uh, NHS uh, waiting lists, we're expecting something on housing uh, and so on. Um, the question is, is that theory right? At first, I mean, you know, A, can you actually do what you're saying you're going to do? Can you meet these targets? B, is that what people want now? D- d- does it standing up in five years time and saying that, well, look, you know, 90% of NHS operations have been delivered within 18 weeks. Does that get you re-elected in the face of um, a very noisy, social media-driven, angry campaign that taps into people's sort of emotions? 
I don't know the answer to that, but that is the big bet they are taking in, in, in Labour HQ. And, and we're only going to find out <laughs> for the next year, few years whether they're right or not by them actually doing it. And I think that one of the problems that they're, one of the headwinds that Danny Street are fighting against is this is the third time that we've had a list of priorities that they're going to observe. And, 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 and one person in Downing Street called this the final chance for Keir Starmer's government in order to set targets that are met over this government because they've chopped and changed them so often. And and so um, Morgan McSweeney might have a theory about people's driveways, but I remember when Tory Eric Pickles had exactly the same theory about people's driveways and, you know, and it, 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 it waxes and wanes and it comes around. But the, the biggest thing for me ahead of Keir Starmer's speech tomorrow is is their change of language of their number one priority. So if you remember, their number one priority was growth, and they would say is still growth. But instead of having a target as part of their missions, which hasn't gone away, but it just is about to become less important, that Britain will, uh, uh, their aim is to have Britain as the, uh, have the highest sustained growth in the G7, which is unobtainable, as we keep saying, because of the US, they're going to move to a disposable income target. So uh, there is a, gonna, they're going to prioritise the pound in your pocket going further uh over the course of the parliament uh rather than something about gdp which most people don't understand but i was talking to a labor mp yesterday and they made the very good point about these really are very different things gdp and disposable income and if at the back half of the parliament for instance overall growth isn't going uh particularly well there is still a way of meeting the disposable income target all you have to do in the back end of the parliament, if you've got a bit of cash, is jack up benefits. So the government is giving itself just a little bit of extra flexibility to sort of achieve its main growth target by allowing itself, uh, by creating, by changing the target so that it can uh, put up universal credit and other uh, uh, benefits for middle and lower uh, earners and thereby achieve that target, which I just thought was quite an interesting uh, an underappreciated point, but but one that um, I think is a complication for the way that they'll uh, that they want to sell it. A couple of bits of news kicking around today, which will actually help Keir Starmer uh, as he prepares to, um, to to set out this big speech. Um, can I just can I just pause you there? The front doorbell's just gone at six minutes past seven. Just give me ten seconds. Hang on. Okay. This is really exciting. Sam Coates has left the podcast and sprinted off towards the front door. I can only assume this is a very eager Amazon delivery driver or an even more eager charity mugger. Who was it, Sam? Uh, it was a boots delivery <laughs> of an advent calendar. <laughs> an advent calendar? Sorry. You're four days late, man. Come on. It's the 4th of December. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I hope my kids will forgive me. Sorry. Um, anyway, um, delivery. Um, there are there are a couple of bits of news around today, which uh, which uh, will help Keir Starmer a little bit as he prepares for this speech tomorrow. Firstly, a big report from the National Audit Office published this morning on the state of Britain's prisons, which is absolutely damning for previous governments, i.e. the Tories, and about the state that they've left the prison service in. We've been saying really since the very start of this government that the one area, Sam, where nobody can deny that the Tories really did leave a disastrous big mess behind was in the prison service. And this report absolutely spells it out um, in, in, in very stark terms. The Pleasant Reef building uh, program that the, the Tories promised is miles, years and years overdue, billions over budget, nowhere near ready. Britain is not in a place to lock up anywhere near as many people as it wants to. This helps Keir Starmer's narrative, obviously, in saying, look at the mess we're trying to clean up. However, to bring it back to the stuff we're talking about at the top, once again, someone like Nigel Farage will just be rubbing his hands because the message that he can send out, this government, like the last government, isn't locking up all these terrible criminals. We are bound to have individual cases happen over the next few years where there's some sort of scandal, someone who should have been in prison but wasn't has done something terrible. Fingers will be pointed at both this government because they're in charge now and the last one. Look at them. They're all the same. They're not looking you up the people that should be locked up. They're not keeping you safe. You can see how this is going to play into Farage's narrative Sam, as well as Keir Starmer's. Okay, well, we better wrap it up there. Prime Minister's questions will be at noon and we'll be all, all be watching for that. And then we will better uh, do this all again tomorrow, Sam, when we will be teeing up Keir Starmer's big speech on Thursday morning. Have a wonderful day. Slightly different politics of Jack and Sam's daily this morning, but I hope you enjoyed it. See you tomorrow. 